Buon pomeriggio, signore e signori. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this virtual uh, webinar uh, hosted by Casa Italiana. And uh, um, it's my great pleasure because of the topic of this webinar, I find personally particularly fascinating. And as you know, it is how Italian cities created religious diversity. And it's also on the impact of how religious diversity, religious minorities that uh, started to flourish after the unification of Italy and after the end of the temporal power of the popes uh, have contributed to change the urban landscape of, of Italian cities. So it, it's a fascinating topic that intersects sociology, history of religion, uh, urban studies. And uh, I'm sure the panel that we have as experts that will be able to tackle the uh, issue from different points of view. Um, my uh, job for the day is very simple because I have the pleasure to present a dear colleague, uh, Massimo Di Gioacchino. We have the fortune of having him teach at NYU with us this semester, and also um, the privilege of having him next fall as Tiro Senio Professor of Italian American Studies, and he will teach both a graduate and an undergraduate course uh, on religious minorities and the history of religion in the uh, early Italian immigration uh, to the United States. Uh, on a very personal level, I have to say that it has been a pleasure to have Massimo uh, on the faculty as a colleague. He allows me to go back to my uh, early studies that were indeed related to uh, history of the church and church-state relationships in Italy. So whenever I have a chance to talk to him, we would never end uh, speaking because we have a lot of interest in common. And to me, again, it's a way to uh, refresh those, those memories and to continue and to see the development of scholarship in this field uh, in, in recent times. Um, uh, Massimo received his PhD from Scuola Normale Superiore of Pisa and the University of Notre Dame in 2018. As I told you, he's teaching with us right now. Um, his studies concentrate on the migration of people and, the, and ideas between Italy and the United States in the late modern period with a special emphasis on religion, but not exclusively. He has a transnational approach that combines religious studies, migration studies, social history, and uh, uh, his uh, um, research in, in archive, especially in some archives of the Vatican that have been closed or, or at least not available until now, is really groundbreaking. And we are all waiting for the publication of his book about a year from today in the spring of uh, 2023, uh, The Ruin of the Souls, Italian Immigrants and the Italian Religious Question in the United States, 1876, uh, 1921. They're looking forward to read it. And we know that because of his uh, research, uh, it's going to be telling us a lot of things that are basically unknown until now and that are definitely of uh, the utmost interest for anybody who has any interest in one of the fields that I've just mentioned. He has a great panel. He put together a great panel of scholars, and we are looking forward to listen to him and his colleagues. Massimo. Thank you so much, Stefano. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning to those of you joining us uh, very early from the West Coast, especially from California. Good morning, New York and the NYU community, and good evening to those connected from Italy. Buonasera a tutti colleghi e amici italiani. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this panel discussion today, organized with the support, passion, and dedication of so many colleagues of Casa Italiana and the Department of Italian Studies at NYU. So let me thank the uh, uh, director of Casa Italiana, Stefano Albertini, Julian Can uh, Julie Canziani, the chair of Italian Studies Department, Alison Cornish, uh, Julian Sachs, and Maria Chiara Giorda, who today speaks as a panelist, but has also been involved uh, in the organization of the event. Today's event will last approximately one hour and a half and will be divided into two parts. First, our panelists will share their remarks and then we will have an open discussion with the public. In order to have at least 30 minutes of discussion, each panelist has agreed to limit their speech to 50 minutes. You can post your question to the panelists or share your remarks in the chat at any time. And so you will find you find a question and answer uh, device in, on your uh, Zoom uh, app, uh, or you can decide to participate later with your camera and microphone on. 
Finally, I remind you that uh, this event is being recorded and will be published on the YouTube channel of Casa Italiana very soon. Before introducing uh, the topic of our discussion, I want to introduce the three panelists who kindly accepted and will use invitation. And I will do that following the order of this, their speeches. Maria Chiara Giorda received her PhD from the Ecole Pratique des Études of the Sorbonne University in Paris in 2007, and is currently Associate Professor of History of Religions at the University of Romadre. Her research interests include the history of religions, geography of religions, religion and urban spaces, shared religious spaces, history of monasticism and religious diversity. Among her recent publications, I'd like to mention Geography of, of Encounters, The Making and Unmaking of, uh, Making of Spaces, published by Pilgrave in 2021, Territories, Spaces, and Religious Places in Metamorphosi Quaderni di Architettura, October 2020, and Geografia delle Religioni, published in the Manuale delle Scienze della Religione, published by Morcellian in 2019. Jog Agnew is Distinguished Professor of Geography at UCLA. He has been President of the American Association of uh, Geographers and received several awards. Among them, the Guggenheim Fellowship, the Chancellor's Awards for Distinguished Scholarship of the Syracuse University, UCLA Awards in Distinguished Teaching, and the Choice Outstanding Title Book Award. His work focuses on political and urban geography, particularly in relation to Italy. He regularly teaches courses on cities of Europe and the Mediterranean, Mediterranean world. In 1995, he published Rome in the World, series, World City series of the publisher Wiley, and he has also published Plays and Politics in Modern Italy, Chicago University Press, and the Geopolitics of the Catholic Church in the journal Geopolitics, 2012. He has written several papers on the struggle between the papacy and the new Italian state over changes in the last landscape of the city of Rome from 1820 to 1950. Silvia Omenetto is a research fellow in geography of religions at Sapienza University of Rome. In her research, she deals with the territorial processes activated by Italian communities abroad and by foreign ones in Italy, and is also interested in the transformation of urban space through religious architecture. Among her most recent publications, Geography, uh, geographic information system as a tool in geography of religion in Historia Religionum 2019, seppur informali l'invisibilità urbana dei gruppi religiosi in Archivio di Studi Urbani e Regionali 2021. Thanks to all of you for being here today. So in this panel discussion, we want to highlight and examine the rich and complex religious urban landscape that Italian cities reveal. <clears throat> Our goal is to move beyond and somehow deconstruct an understanding of, it, of the Italian urban heritage as a postcard. We can say, we would say in Italian, una cartolina, that is an, as an attractive and positive, but also static and homogeneous depiction of the past and only of the past. This understanding of Italian cities is, of course, the result, the, uh, the historic result of the ways European and then American society have experienced, or perhaps we can say consumed, uh, the Italian cities in the past. From the aristocratic young man who undertook the grand tour in the 18th century to present day mass tourism, the Italian urban landscape has been lead, experienced for centuries as a monolithic creation. For instance, as John Agnew argues, the interest in ancient Rome and papal Rome has sometimes obfuscated any possible different understanding of Rome as a creative force for religious diversity. However, since its unification in 1861 and then with the annexation of Rome in 1870, Italy has become a much more diverse society, hosting today a large non-Catholic population, of which Silvia Omenetto will give testimony. As a consequence, its urban landscape has profoundly changed. And even today, it keeps reflecting an extraordinary and often overlooked architectural and material variety. Our discussion will focus on the radical transformation of Italian cities from that geometry of monopoly, the monopoly being, of course, that of the Catholic Church, to what Maria Chiara Giorda describes as, and here I quote her, an intriguing, chaotic, and 
complex religious space, end quote. How have urban spaces conformed and refrained religious practices, in particularly in places of worship? How is religious diversity experienced and perceived in urban spaces today? In trying to answer this and other questions, our interest is also related to examining the history of religious freedom in Italy, considering the latter not only as an abstract legal framework, but more importantly, as the concrete ability of religious communities to create and reframe uh, the place they live according to their own spiritual needs and beliefs. With that being said, uh, let me thank one more time all the panelists and uh, give the floor to Maria Chiara Giorda. Thank you so much. So thank you so much and good morning or good afternoon to everybody. First of all, I would like to thank my uh, colleague Massimo Di Gioacchino for uh, uh, having organized this uh, panel and also Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimo for hosting this panel. But I would also thank, uh, uh, before my uh, speech, some scholars with uh, whom I'm working and I've been sharing this research, in particular Paolo Naso, Sergio Aquilante, Davide Remetti, Johan Cosma, and all my Italian and uh, not only Italian research group uh, SHARP. So uh, I start uh, with some uh, consideration about uh, Italy, but uh, directly about Rome. Anyone who images uh, the city of Rome will think of it as uh, the world's Catholic space par excellence. Its religious brand uh, linked to the Pope, the Vatican, uh, churches, basilicas, Catholic priests and nuns, uh, related to pilgrims, but also to tourists who come from all over the world to visit the religious sites that over the centuries have built the city's religious Catholic landscape. However, a super religious diversity is today evident in more peripheral neighborhoods where mosques, Orthodox churches, Buddhist temple, Hinduist, Baha'i, Sikh centers rise. But I leave to Silvio Menetto in her speech a reflection on this. But it's not real only in the outskirts. It would be enough to walk along some streets of the very center of Rome, such as Via 20 Settembre, to realize that this diversity is not only peripheral, but central. And it's not only current but historical. Via 20 September, for example, is a commemoration of that September 20, 1870, when the city of Rome stopped to be under Papa rule and with the ride on Porta Pia, La Breccia di Porta Pia, began to be Italian and thus more secular and open to other religions. Along and near Via 20 September, we can find since uh, some years after that uh, 1870, the signs of that opening to other religions. For example, an Anglican church, a Valdensian temple, a Methodist church, the Presbyterian Church of Scotland, all within 20 minutes walking distance. If we consider Italy, the history of religious freedom, and in particular, the freedom to build places of worship begins earlier with the Statuto Albertino, 1848, later applied to the city of Rome. It's a history characterized by a movement of constant openness towards the recognition of diversity, not without uh, contradiction and ambiguities. Moreover, it's a local history through which every Italian city has become the laboratory of experimentation of the management of such diversity. The observation lens represented by the religious places shows the continuous tensions between what is, what is lived and what is prescribed, between the maintenance of the tradition and forces of innovation. The result is an intriguing, chaotic and complex religious space. Rome, which is famous all over the world for its Catholic history and geography paradoxically can be, as during this seminar will be a special space to show and test this diversity. I consider Rome and I suggest to consider everybody's Rome as a specific case of the Italian history of urban religion through the special perspective of, the, of religious places. 
The places I have just mentioned around Via 20 Settembre are traces still living of a religious freedom and in particular of the possibility of building places of worship. They are examples through which we can observe the variety of the relationship, sometimes ambiguous, between visibility and invisibility, between religious and secular, of places, but also in places. If the possibility of building places of worship ought to be considered part of the um, broader religious freedom, as I suggest, we must, first of all, notice that the juridical reference to this right have long been absent specifically in the normative stages that have characterized the religious history of Italy, and still it is absent. The Statuto Albertino was extended to the Italian regions in the following years, recognizing equal civil and political rights to the Valdensians and Jews, first of all. Roman Catholic apostolic religion was the only religion of the kingdom, while the other cults were simply tolerated in accordance with the uses and the special regulation concerning them. This statuto was then extended to the city of Rome when the city became Italian, 1870. Other religions started to be admitted and other places to be accepted, but not properly regulated because of the absence of a law concerning buildings. In this long and we can say also homogeneous Italian history, a broader religious freedom for all religions were, was inaugurated only with the constitution in 1948 and characterized by the attempt to harmonize the state regulation with those of religious denomination. Religions which are free and equal before the law are not regulated by a specific religious freedom law. And still, there isn't a specific space in the constitution concerning religious places. Only in the text of single agreements uh, in Tese based on uh, Article 8 of the constitution, and I would like to stress that only 13 religions uh, uh, until now have signed it, we can find a way for regulating and disciplinating this issue. In accordance with this article, this means that each religious group may independently determine the rules for the identification and the management of its places of worship. Generally, the few tracks in national law about places show how the regulation was born and thought for the Catholic Church. And although thinkable for other religions, it has been interpreted in a very questionable way. Regions are the holders of the legis legislative power in the field of government of the territory, and the municipalities, the cities, are the protagonists of the local planning, its application and its management. So today, a plethora of religious places of different nature than Catholic churches are scattered throughout the urban spaces, frequented by millions of people being built occupying existing secular buildings or sharing the same place with other religious groups. Believers gather in places that are not fully recognized from our legal system, being juridically considered cultural places or places for social activities, but they are places of worship. Such chaos and legislative contradictions have also produced this effect that we call of camouflage, they prefer to remain invisible or not to appear. They prefer not to claim their right for recognition in order to not to attract the public attention. They prefer to be hidden to survive. The centrality of the urban space and the peculiarity of each urban space has driven scholars to observe cities rather than nation states when studying diversity, its management and its governance. The gap between local and national started to manifest itself in the second half of the 19th century, during the long process of unification of Italy. Since then, we can observe the traces of urban religion based on places, in the interstices of the history, the geography, the urban planning legislation of each individual city. Among the various cities, Turin, Torino, the first capital of Italy, was the first one which had experienced the effects of the granting of civil and religious rights. 
And it was evident, visible with the huge construction of the of a, a synagogue, the only synagogue of Turin, made by three synagogues, and a Valdensian temple in the second half of the 19th century. In the case of Rome, it's interesting to note that many non-Catholic Christian groups claimed for their place immediately after what we call a point of no return, of a new history of the reciprocal impact of religions, plural, and urban space. A new era was coming, 1870. The variety of the dynamics of settlement of the first non-Catholic places of worship can be framed and analyzed within the same categories which are applicable even today for observing the location of religious places. In particular, I will refer to the concepts of visibility and invisibility camouflage. And I will resorting to the strategies of settlement by construction of new buildings, by sharing the same place or by converting a secular or a religious place into another religious place. I present here three of the places that I mentioned before, the Anglican, the Valdensian and the Methodist temples that are representative for these different strategies of localization, mobilizing different spatial categories. Under the historical and the geographical lens, some examples of a newborn chaotic and not regulated urban religion will be shown for stressing the continuity of the long durée of some patterns. In 1870, the prohibition to build non-Catholic buildings within the Aurelian walls of Rome came to an end, and this opportunity was immediately cited by reformed religious exponent, already present in Rome for sure from some years. It seems to start an operation of visibility of non-Catholic cult, which was initially adapted to the physical space available, usable and imposed, and then led in 1873 to the explicit appropriation of a portion of public land in the new kingdom. In the spring of 1858, Alonso Potter, Bishop of Pennsylvania, visited Rome and celebrated the Holy Communion in a private home in Piazza Trinita del Monte. This was the first time the liturgy of the Episcopal Church was celebrated in Rome, and it immediately led to a diplomatic repercussions. A few months later, Reverend London arrived from the United States and held mass in the presence of an other American citizens with whom he decided to establish a permanent Episcopal church called Grace Church. And it was organized in 1859. But Mr. Lanton returned to the United States in 1861, and so the Grace Church became dormant. In the next years, different bishops went to Rome to revive the parish, but the opposition from the papal authority and the Catholic institution made life difficult, very difficult for this church. Only after 1870, funds were raised for the building of a real church in Rome, in Via Nazionale, and the name Grace Church was changed in St. Paul within Wall. And the name recalled the St. Paul outside the wall, the big and magnificent still existent uh, Catholic church. The ground was broken in uh, 1872 and the church was consecrated in 1876. It was the first example of visibility of a non-Catholic cult in the heart of the center of Catholicism, built from scratch and conceived in opposition to the dominant model. The magnificent church was and is recognizable to all people walking around. It was a sort of counter altar to the church of the same name, St. Paul outside the walls. It was the first material trace of the extension of religious freedom to other religions in this case, Christian. <laughs> it marked the beginning of new ending, of a new never ending story of religious places wanted from people. Unlike this Anglican temple, camouflaged in the fabric and the urban architecture is the Valdensian temple of Via 4 November. Completed in 1884, the work of the architect Benedetto Pandolfi is presented on the outside in neo-Romanesque style and inside in an eclectic presence of neo-Renaissance, neoclassical and neo-Romanesque style. 
It was built in an empty space with the aim of establishing a material signpost of the Christian church, one of the first to be tolerated. Unlike the Church of St. Paul, it was an hidden place whose recognizability was and it's not today obvious, but it's entrusted to prior knowledge. You can't notice if you don't know it. Walking around, it's difficult to distinguish it from a secular building as other in the same area are. Finally, the Episcopal Methodist Church is an example of shared religious place in diachronic sense, not very visible because it's in between the secular and the religious, both specially, the buildings that surround it, and architecturally. It's a religious place built in a block of flats whose religious history was ancient and very, very lively. In 1872, work began on the construction of the building in Via 20 September that was to house the Ministry of Finance, which was completed in 1876. Pre-existing convents, churches, and other religious buildings were completely destroyed to make room for the new Via Firenze and on the area thus obtained, the Methodist temple was built. So there was plans for the temples, one Italian and other American, along uh, the same Via Firenze, but also a publishing house, the theological school, its boarding school, the teacher lodgings, and the general administration. In September 1893, the first stone was laid, and the temple was solemnly dedicated on September 20, 1895. Then, as now, Although we are faced with a long religious history of the place before Catholic and then Methodist, of the two entrances, Via Firenze is completely anonymous and the second entrance via 20 September is not recognizable embedded in a building. A camouflage between secular and religious that helps to highlight the history made rather of continuity than fractures of religious places in Italian urban spaces. So some concluding remarks. The three churches inaugurated in the aftermath of Breccia di Porta Pia show, first of all, how immediately after the granting of freedom of religion, the construction, the first need was the construction of places belonging to different religions and denominations. And this construction shaped the urban space of Rome, shaped the center of the urban space of Rome. As in Rome, this process could also be reconstructed in other Italian cities. Among similarities and differences, they make each urban religious history as a peculiar one. Secondly, the construction took place without a precise legal framework in place and was little discussed by the municipal authorities who, then as now, have never structured a planning that takes into account the buildings of other religions. And finally, the spatial, but also the architectural perspective suggests the use of some categories applicable to the past as well to the present. There are, were in fact visible places, but also invisible and camouflaged by facade that are not recognizable and in a perspective of sharing. So we can find the dynamics of sharing the same place and of replacement of the same place in the same place. I finish here and I thanks uh, for uh, the attention and I hope that everybody can come in Rome for visiting these places uh, with these uh, 20 minutes, uh, uh, very, very easy walking in order to see or not to see this uh, uh, urban, religious uh, urban uh, space. Thank you, Massimo. Thank you, Maria Chiara. Um, before giving the floor to John, um, I just and I would like to remind the public that the you uh, the the public is you can you can start posing questions to the and sharing remarks in the Q and A uh, device you have on the uh, in in your Zoom app and so as our panelists share the remarks you can start ask and and we we are gonna address your questions immediately after uh, just a few words on what I believe are some very important toy, um, points that Maria Chiara Giorda highlights. Um, we cannot make a history of the religious presence of a Catholic confessions 
And we cannot make a history of religious diversity and religious freedom in Italy, just focusing on the presence, the visibility and the recognition of that present. Uh, in studying that those topics, we have to confront the presence with the absence. So we should make also a history of the absence of certain confessions and some places. And not only studying the visibility, but the invisibility of those places, which was one of Maria Chiara, uh, and my view, one of Maria Chiara's more, um, most interesting points. And not only the history of the recognition, but also of the lack of the recognition. So absence, invisibility, and lack of recognition are also, should also part of our examination. We cannot just study what we see, what is recognized and what is there. And so I'm just gonna stop here because our discussion will be uh, will come later. And so uh, it's my pleasure to give um, the floor to Jog Nagno. Okay, uh, thank you uh, Massimo for, uh, for, that, for, that, uh, for the introduction early, earlier in particular. So, you know, as we all know, Rome is the seat of the Roman Catholic Church. So it's unsurprising that this association makes the city seem something less than a paragon of religious pluralism. In a popular view, papal Rome vies with ancient Rome as the fundamental cliche to decode the city's landscape. Yet contemporary Rome is largely the product of the past 150 years of growth and expansion. The struggle between the Catholic Church and the Italian state, particularly between 1871 and 1943, produced an impasse and an opening rather than reconciliation between the church and state in the making over of the city. After an anecdote concerning St. Andrew's Church of Scotland in Rome, one of the churches that um, uh, Maria Chiara referred to, which is located on uh, Via uh, 20 Settembre, I revisit two uh, articles of mine from 1998 and 2010 that illustrate the roots of the impasse in the city's resistance to a singular narrative about its past and present. If the huge Vittoriano monument to the Kingdom of Italy came to challenge the papal skyline by the 1920s, subsequent efforts under fascism to make over spaces, recalling the city as the seat of a great empire, as in the Piazza Augusto Imperatore, um, and gestures towards accommodation with the church, as in the Via della Conciliazione, these signal the inherent difficulty of imposing a singular religious story onto the fabric of the city. In challenging the temporal authority of the church, even as it attempted accommodation after the Concordat of 1929, the Italian state necessarily had to recognize that the city's future could not be monopolized by only one church if Italy were to be more than a front for the church or revert to being merely a geographical expression. In 1984, this position was finally formalized in the revision of the Concordat. Turning first to my uh, anecdote, the Church of Scotland in Rome. Before unification, there were multiple Italies in which the role of the Catholic Church was different. Thus, Tuscany long had a greater public tolerance for other sects of Christianity than did the Papal States, under the authority of the popes. Um, a Protestant church indigenous to Northwestern Italy, the Waldensians was also tolerated if less publicly in various places in the North. An interesting case study of the movement towards religious pluralism in the beating heart of the Catholic church, the city of Rome, is the story of St. Andrew's Church of Scotland located today on Via Venti Settembre in the center of the city. I attended this church one Easter Sunday a few years ago and was surprised by the size and obvious mixed ethnicity and national background of the congregation. I was expecting a few ancient Scots exiled to Rome. The minister was Scottish, but many of those officiating in various capacities were Korean and African. It doesn't look like much of a church from outside. It's very much an example of the camouflage church that uh, Maria Chiara was referring to. It's wedged between two larger apartment buildings, and at first sight looks like the entrance to the flanking buildings. It was not built to call attention to itself, but once inside, it recapitulates the simplicity and warmth of a typical Scottish parish church. This building was opened in 1885. Permission was granted specifically on condition that it did not look like a church. So even the Piemontesi running the new capital 
were under no illusions about op how open they could be about Protestant churches in the city of Rome. The congregation had begun as early as the uh, 1860s with informal meetings among Scottish and American Presbyterians. From 1871 until 1885, the church was located in a building near the Porta de Flaminia. Its history, therefore, is of progressive formalization of its status from underground to fully recognized church. It's exemplary, I think, of the slow motion pluralization of the religious landscape in Rome. But what about the relationship then, uh, or how this reflects the changing relationship between church and state, between the Catholic Church on the one hand, or the papacy, if you like, and the Italian state on the other? Arguably, both the liberal and fascist regimes in the years from 1870 to 1943 shared the desire to make over the city in their respective self-images as respectively a newly emergent, emergent nation state and a resurgent Italian empire. Although some specific interventions during the years 1870 to 1920 have exercised interest, for example, the building of the Vittoriano, that great monument um, in the middle of the city on uh, Piazza Venezia, and the construction of the Corso Vittorio Emanuele Due, to name two, just to name two, it has been the fascist period that's been the greatest focus for those investigating the redevelopment of Rome as a crucial part of the political cultural changes associated with the new Italy. This is not hard to understand. Fascism has come to hold a fascination that the previous liberal regime could not because of its overtly ideological cast and rhetorical bombast. Recent rehabilitation, if still incomplete in contemporary Italian politics and self-conscious manipulation of the physical landscape of Rome and other cities to express its political intentions have also contributed to this perspective. Although the ghosts of Italy's past and present uh, especially those of the old conquering Roman Empire, were welcome in the new nation. They were not readily conjoined in a renewed city that would do credit to the ambitions of its rulers. While the continuity between regimes, liberal and fascist, can be overstated, the danger in much recent writing about Italian fascism in general and its impact on Rome in particular is to take the claims of its proponents that fascism was truly effective in translating its plans into practice too much at face value. Perhaps the best way of putting this in, in the present context is to say that fascist manipulation of the phys physical fabric of Rome failed to achieve most of what it intended. The reconfiguration and monumentalization of the city to singularly represent the political breach with the past that its revolution was supposedly all about. The question is why this was so spectacularly the case Given how successful in terms of their goals, other dramatic uh, makeovers, such as, say, those of Paris and Vienna in the late 19th century, had been. My argument's twofold. Uh, first, that making over Paris and Vienna is, in a singular manner was relatively easy compared to compromising the vast storehouse of rooted memories and living contradictions that would have had to be undermined for anything similar to succeed in Rome particularly the continued presence and symbolic power of the papacy in the city. And then second, that unlike in France and Austria, where architectural and cultural goals were clearly allied and mutually reinforcing, fascism was itself fatally divided ideologically over what it was trying to achieve in making over Rome, tying itself tightly to the past of ancient imperial Rome or eclectically building a new city on top and around the inherited one and, and compromised by a political process under fascism that was anything other than linear and efficacious. In the end, the ghosts of past Rome's inhabiting the existing city haunted the actual achievement of any sort of coherent new city as a monument to the, quote, new, unquote, Italy. Of course, this it doesn't mean that the interventions of the fascist Ventennio have had no effect on how the city is experienced. Certainly, fascist area sites uh, era sites such as the Via del Impero, Eur, and the Foro Italico have become integral to the city's spatial form, but they have thereby become only parts of the overall pastiche of the city and not the directing elements in the urban fab fabric that a makeover worthy of its name would have entailed. The richness of Rome's past and the ambivalence of the regime about its objectives over the course of its rule prevented the successful translation of massive rhetorical ambition 
intercommensurate concrete transformation of the city as a whole. Now, I would focus just to give some examples of this to two specific efforts that have long been associated with particular aspects of fascist plans for Rome. The construction of the Via della Conciliazione through the Rione Borgo between St. Peter's and the River Tiber, and the clearance of a new space around the ruined mausoleum of the Emperor Augustus, the Piazza of the Emperor Augustus, just to the north of the previous intervention, but on the opposite side of the, of the River Tiber. If the first can, be, first can be seen as an attempt at not only reconciling, but somehow capturing the Vatican for the makeover of the city, the second is usually considered as a major example of the cult of Romanità, uh, celebrating the ancient Roman past as a key to making the current Italy, closely associated with what turned out to be the later years of fascism. I've chosen these two precisely for these specific features that they exhibit, rather than, say, for their persisting association with fascism. Indeed, numerous Romans of my acquaintance seem completely unaware, unaware of the precise architectural genealogies of these two sites. The first effort, Via della de, de Conciliazione, was constructed in the years between 1936 and 1950. So like some other fascist projects like the Eur complex on the southwest side of the city, it was only finished years after the regime had long gone. The message of, of Via della Conciliazione as a result was lost. The second effort, the clearance around the mausoleum of Augustus to create the Piazza del Augusto Imperatore and the reconstructed Arapacis, the ancient altar of peace originally located in Rome to the southwest of the current exhibit on the same site, was also a product of fascism during its later so-called imperial phase. By the time he'd become synonymous with fascism in the mid-1930s, Mussolini undoubtedly represented himself as the new Augustus, for an Italy transforming itself into an empire. Claiming the mantle of Augustus through singling out and celebrating his tomb from the medieval maze in which it was buried became one of the main features of a presumed reinstatement of ancient Roman values, at least as construed by Mussolini, in the new Rome. Fortuitously, 1937 was the presumed 2000th anniversary of Augustus's birth. As a combination archeological dig and reconstruction of a neighborhood with new buildings and an exhibition, the piazza was from the start a mixed use, and its message in the end has proved as mixed. The city itself was a large part of the problem for both of these two projects. So many different Romes were in play, classical Rome, medieval Rome, Renaissance Rome, Baroque Rome, 18th century Rome, pre-unification -re, pre papal Rome, and post-unification Rome. Each of these was built on top of and often out of previous ones. Without a clean start by total demolition, the city's very complexity of historical reference worked against any kind of comprehensive or coherent rework. To con conclude then with Rome as it is in relation to the topic of today. Rome today, of course, sprawls way beyond the limits of the city as it was in 1950, but it has inherited the resistance to a singular layout and structure that undermined the efforts of the fascist regime to make over the city in the 1930s. In this context, the historical complexity of Rome would inevitably have set limits to what could be done with, this, with the city, save for a savage reconstruction after the manner of Haussmann in Paris. From this perspective, we should perhaps be grateful to fascism. That remaking would also have involved abandoning rather than trying to expropriate selectively elements from the Roman past. The impasse between the papacy and the Italian state in its various iterations was what laid the groundwork for the flourishing and normalization of other religious traditions within the confines of the landscape of the city of Rome. Each, each of these, church and state, failing to co-opt the other, opened the door to the sort of normalization of other denominations, sects, and religions signaled by the embedding of St. Andrew's Church of Scotland in the very heart of the city, notwithstanding its limited ecclesiastical profile in the street facade. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jog Agnew. Um,
um, of course, uh, as 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 you mentioned, we cannot. So, in trying to understand how Italian cities should be decoded, um, and in analyzing the presence, visibility, and recognition of non Catholic, non Catholic denominations, there is a larger uh, and a, a larger relation dynamic. We would say sometimes conflict. Uh, and that is the, the relation with conflict between church and state. And so um, uh, definitely the in, in highlighting the efforts to uh, of the Italian liberal state and then of fascism to reread, uh, to manipulate the city, um, we cannot we cannot fail to recognize that the presence of non-Catholic denominations uh, were, somehow part of this dialogue between church and state. Of course, the state, the liberal state, and later uh, the fascist state, and even later after World War II of Republican Italy, uh, when dealing with religious diversity, with religious um, freedom, with the presence of religious denomination, had, first of all, to confront themselves with the uh, with the Catholic present, the Catholic power, and the Catholic past. And I think uh, that John, in this, you uh, you opened another um, another uh, level of our discussion today. I see some 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 of you are have started um, uh, posing and questions in the Q and A, and I. I continue um, inviting you to do so, as this will make our discussion uh, later in, in 15, 20 minutes, uh, hopefully even richer. And with that being said, I give the floor to Silvio Menetto. Thank you again, John, and thank you, Silvia, for sharing re your remarks with us today. Thank you for the invitation and uh, uh, good evening from Rome. Uh, in my speech, I will turn in consideration the contemporary urban space of Rome, which has uh, recently been described by scholar Valeria Fabretti and Pietro Vereni as a religious global, thanks to the plurality of faith that has uh, changed its urban morphology. Rome can no longer be considered only the cradle of Christianity, but uh, a privileged laboratory for the study of Italian religious diversity. It concentrates, indeed, in its urban space, important national dynamics. Migration phenomena has certainly uh, changed the cultural composition of Italian society by accelerating a process of religious di uh, differentiation, uh, which, as the speaker who preceded me uh, pointed out, originates from previous historical processes. Together with the centers old present of Jews, Waldesian, Lutheran, Orthodox, and Evangelicals, new confessional groups took root in two different moments of the 20th century. The first was in the mid-70s, when the Pente Pentecostal, the Mormons, and the first Hindu and Baptist groups uh, was consolidated. The second moment was in the mid 19 when the Islamic Orthodox community of Romanian uh, nationality and Sikh arrived. This new religious differentiation is reshaping the urban space, the Italian urban space. This transformation also concerned the materiality and the location of place of worship compared to the past. The absence of a real uh, national law of religious freedom and restrictive regional planning legislation together with the different economic resources available to each uh, religious organization have had a significant impact on a non-inclusive planning of religious places in a local scale. In this framework, I will present the geography of three religious community selected on the basis of their institutional relationship with the Italian state the Church of the Jesus Christ of the Later Day Saint, which has stipulated an intesa, an agreement, in uh, uh, 2012. The Romanian Orthodox Diocese, uh, uh, Diocese of Italy, uh, which has uh, been recognized uh, uh, as a cult body, a cult and missi, uh, in 2011. And the last and third uh, case study, C community, C community, which has not yet embarked on uh, these institutional processes. The aim is to uh, show 
uh, how the different relationship between the Italian state and the religious confession have built over time a geography of chaos and a, a, a urban scale, a geography characterized by variegated and sometimes unrecognizable religious architectures. As Maria Carla Giorda uh, pointed out, uh, in Italy there is no uh, um, a specific law on religious freedom. Uh, this is a set of articles, or uh, constitutional article and law. Uh, the Italian constitution affirmed the equality of all religions under the Article 8, the freedom to worship individually or collectively under the Article 19, and the protection from any form of legislative restriction, tax burden, and legal capacity uh, under the Article 20. At the same time, uh, the religions between uh, uh, the relation, sorry, the relation between uh, uh, the uh, Italian state and religious confession are regulated by four uh, main levels of recognition that build a pyramid uh, system of right and duty. At the apex uh, of this pyramid uh, uh, is the uh, Catholic Church. Uh, protected in a privileged way by the concordat. At the second level, uh, there are the religious that have stipulated into agreement called Intesa with the Italian state. Today, there are 12 religious denominations with Intesa. And the, uh, the third level of this uh, pyramid, there are uh, the religions uh, that are recognized as uh, uh, admitted worship, culti ammessi, on the basis of the fascist law the fascist law number uh, 1159 of 1929. And uh, today uh, there are 37 religions uh, that are recognized as hermetic worship. Finally, at the first, last and fourth level of this pyramid, there are all religions forming cultural or social association, which have not yet obtained any institutional recognition. This pyramid system has a strong urban impact because some of regional planning legislation adopted. They promote this legislation, promote religions within TESA and recognize as a body of worship and exclude religious denomination without recognition. One example, well, one example, the Lazio region. Lazio region where Rome is located has uh, opted this differentiation. The, um, the Lazio Diso, the law number 27 of 1990, uh, through this law, uh, each municipality of Lazio grants religious organization with Intesa and does recognize the dogmatic cult that request, requested the possibility uh, of identifying an area for the construction of a building of worship with its general town plan. Thanks to this uh, legislation, the first Mormon temple was recently built in Rome and inaugurated in January uh, 2019. It's the um, 162nd uh, temple in the world. The construction of this temple, the Mormon temple, was possible for two reasons. Of course, the first uh, one, the agreement, agreement stipulated uh, between the church, um, the Mormon church in Italian state in uh, 2012. On the basis of this uh, uh, agreement, the municipality of Rome recognized re the right uh, to build a temple. Uh, the area was identified at north of Rome in a Buffalota area. And the temple was uh, uh, built in Rome because of course, it's considered the cradle of the Christianity, but also for logistical reasons. Buffalota area is located close to the Great Ring Road, and for this reason, it's easy, uh, easily accessible for all over Italy through the main highways. The second reason is the economic resources. Construction of the temple was financed by the Mormon Church. The Mormon Church did not use the eight per the, the eight per thousand. Sorry, uh, the eight per thousand is a financing system. Each year, each Italian taxpayer can choose who to send this share to among twelve religious group we agreement. Today, uh, the House of Lord is clearly visible from the Great Ring Road thanks to two imposing spears that each reach 
42 uh, meters and 47 meter height. The temple was designed in the United States, but recalls the Roman cathedral designed by Bernini and Borromini. It was built uh, with fine materials. Uh, the exterior are in fact in sardine and granite, and the interior, the floor, for example, in Carrara marble and uh, Perlato Svevo from Lucca. The chandeliers are in Murano glass. If the Lazio regional urban legislation protect uh, religions with uh, intesa and with economic resources and excludes or does religious group that not have sufficient economic resources or without an institutional recognition. This community, such as the Romanian Orthodox Diocese and Sikh community, are forced to find and occupy places for uh, ritual practices independently and outside the mechanism of urban planning. For example, in the last 40 years, the Romanian Orthodox presence in Rome has been uh, characterized by a specific sentiment dynamics uh, called replacement. Two architectural typology correspond to it, the reuse of Catholic structures and the reuse of abandoned secular spaces. According to, so uh, to scholar Maria Chiara Giorda and Joa Kozma, a significant weight to the formation of the Romanian Orthodox parishes was initially played by the Catholic Church, the municipality or other entity that owned parish, Catholic parish structures no longer in use. In addiction to the increased availability, this building have been chosen by the Orthodox community for an easier conversion of the space to the canon of reference. Among the many examples that can be given, the use of disused Catholic place of worship is found in the case of the parish St. Pantaleon. At first, the liturgical services were served in the chapel dedicated to St. Pantaleon in the church of St. Joseph Potolengo in Valle Aurelia, in the western area of Rome, and since uh, 2012 in the church of Oblets of St. Joseph, a Catholic institute in uh, Via Adriano. The conversion of Catholic architecture prevail until 2011, the year of the recognition as a domestic worship by the Romanian Orthodox Diocese in Italy. The recognition has allowed parishes uh, to register with the revenue agency and obtain their own tax code with which to rent, purchase, renovate, and attend place of worship. Although the Romanian Orthodox Church has obtained a recognition and can make use of the law number 27, the regional law of Lazio, um, it does not have sufficient economic resources to build a new place of worship. Gradually, the use and transformation of secular building of public or private ownership has made its way. Uh, the headquarters, for example, the headquarters of the Romanian Orthodox Diocese in uh, Italy is located in the Via Ardiatina and uh, uh, is also the monastery of the Dormition of the Mother of God, uh, is part of this logic of the reuse into the built heritage. Uh, previously, in fact, uh, this monastery, this headquarters, was a villa was a private residence of a Roman family. A third example that I want to briefly present is that uh, of the Sikhs. The Sikh temples in Rome are three and are located along the Great Rim Road that surrounding the capital, the Rome. Uh, in all three cases, Sikh community have rented or purchased uh, with their own resources, economic resources, three disused industrial warehouses. Uh, the, the, the choice, the first choice to use these industrial um, buildings uh, derives uh, by two reasons, two factors. The one, the first reason uh, is the various sick practices that need large building. Um, a good bar can hold to uh, 400 people on Sunday. Uh, the uh, Gurvara is a place of religious formation uh, and socialization that consists of several rooms. The room dedicated to prayer, the one, another room to, dedicated to the sacred book, the Sri Guru Granth Sahib, uh, um, are 
room uh, in, where the, uh, the book is stored in the night, a kitchen and a room for sharing a meal and a dressing room. The second one, the second factor uh, determining the use of industrial building is also the lack of institutional recognition of Sikhism. The process to achieve it began in uh, 2006 and was interrupted in 2016. The Sikh community could not agree on bylaw status to be given to the organization. Without institutional recognition, urban planning legislation on a religious building does not apply to Sikhism. It's not possible, so in another word, it's not possible to build new Sikh temple, new Gurbara, according to Sikh architectural canon. However, the Sikh community used an expedient. They found a social association that allowed them to rent or buy a building that becomes a Gurbara. This expedient is based only on the economic resources of the Sikh community, which often fail to renovate the building according to reference architectural canons. I conclude my speech by saying uh, that the, the choice to present uh, the, uh, these three case studies was taken presently to highlight how the different treatments to which religious denominations are subject on a legal level create in turn on inequality, geography, or religious diversity. Some religious denominations, in fact, lead the contradiction of an Italian constitution which recognizes and protects the right to gather for worship in a public way, but does not ensure dignified place. The result is a landscape composed of religious place distributed and level, and imbalance polarization between the Christian, Catholic majority, and the various historical and ethnic uh, religious group, a network of building characterized by hybrid identity that produce problem on camouflage and invisibility, a geography of chaos, a double geography, because in one hand, uh, we can see but majestic and recognizable architecture guaranteed to confession with Intesa and with considerable economic power, and the other hand by hybrid architecture in which religious and secular merge, which is a significant effort in invisibility of this uh, place of worship and their uh, community. And thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Silvia Omenetto. Um, and I, I took note, Silvia, as you were speaking, um, and I, uh, I think that this image of the pyramid with the different uh, legal recognition uh, of religious liberty, um, this image perfectly works. So, um, in for those of for those of us connected from the U.S., for especially for our American public, the difference should be uh, should be shocking and should be very clear. While the U.S. Constitution and especially the First Amendment recognizes religious liberty as a um, as a universal principle and as a universal right. And so it's not the result of a um, political process. Religious, uh, um, religious freedom is uh, by default a right of all the American people uh, because of its history, because of its politics and so much more. In Italy, uh, religious freedom has been the product of a political process. So it has been, and especially the recognition of religious diversity, the recognition of the religious freedom of other denominations has been the result, as you were, as you perfectly highlighted, Silvia, of a of the different intesa, of the different agreements between the state and the single uh, uh, non-Catholic denomination. But as you said, this is a, you call that an unbalanced situation. It creates a geography of uh, inequality where there is the Catholic church, there are the denominations who got this recognition through a political process. And again, I want to stress this, and there are those denominations who did not receive the uh, made, uh, was were able to uh, have, uh, to stipulate this agreement and receive what we call in Italian, and in Tesa. And so thank you, Silvia. These were just a few remarks 
our goal, as as I said, is to to leave the floor to our public who is still um, connected with us. And so, first of all, I will I will ask John uh, Agnew and Maria Chiara Giorda to turn on their cameras so we can all um, be here. We can all show ourselves. And we have started receiving questions. I know that especially in the recordings, these questions will not be uh, shown. And so I just uh, acknowledge that Marlene Poor uh, has been asking about uh, what we call in Italian the otto per mille, the eight, uh, eight for thousand. That is the compulsory uh, contribution that every single Italian taxpayer is is, ans is requested to give either to religious confession or to the state. And so she was asking uh, about this. And her question is um, how, how the system works and, and um, are people happy with this method? I think uh, Maria Cara wants to say something about this. And I know there is a, there, there is a question by Cristina Bellini who is uh, connected with us live should be able to see these questions, but again, who will see it later will not. And Cristina Bellini's question is, how do you think, uh, what do you th think about the debate on the construction of mosques in Italian cities? I think Cristina Bellini, if I'm not wrong, will be able to sh to ask her question by herself. So I I, I'm, I would be glad if, he sh if she can uh, turn on her microphone and camera and ask our panelists that question herself. Um, but before we and before and why Chris, we our staff makes this possible, um, uh, Maria Chiara or Silvia or John, do you want to say anything about the uh, the way religious denominations are funded through the eight four thousand system? If I can add something to my written answer to Marlene Poor, I would like to say that uh, this is uh, a subspecie of discrimination in the discrimination. I mean, we say that only 13, 12, 13 uh, religions uh, have signed this agreement, the Intesa, with the Italian state. And uh, it offer uh, not only a, a difference, but a, a, a divide and, and a, a very, very different position and form of recognition uh, related to rights and religious rights. So inside the points concerned uh, in the text of the intes of this uh, agreement, one is Otto per mille, the economic uh, uh, part uh, of, uh, of this complex, uh, um, uh, complex uh, issue. And so I would like to say that uh, if one religion has this agreement can collect money from uh, the believers that can uh, uh, choose to put the a part of the tax in uh, in the system and towards this uh, religion, this uh, community. If they don't have, they can't collect money. So uh, to show you an example, Orthodox uh, churches and Islam haven't got any agreement and so they can't collect money. And so there is a, a question of economic imbalance. Uh, we show it uh, with uh, Alberto Vanolo uh, talking about an in unequal competition between religions. So unequal competition. And I would like also to add and to remember everybody that the only church which has the uh, Intesa agreement, but they um, choose not to, to have the possibility of Otto per mille is uh, the Mormon uh, church. And so there is an imbalance and uh, an equal uh, competition between who has and who doesn't uh, have the, um, doesn't have the uh, agreement, the uh, Intesa. And yes, there is a debate and yes, people are discussing. And yes, uh, there is uh, sometimes uh, a, a wave, a new wave of uh, debate about uh, this topic. And I guess to many American, uh, to many American people, the whole process will sound very, very strange. First of all, why should the taxpayer be forced to make a compulsory donation? Either to the to the to the, do a selected list of religious confessions, but even 
either to the state. Uh, and so the auto eight per thousand, I said eight, four thousand, but I know the, in English, the reference is eight per thousand. The eight per thousand speaks of the whole political uh, process behind Italian religious liberty, Italian religious diversity. And so in, in the US, there is, there is notably a, a strong culture of voluntary donations to um, social civic causes and to religious denominations. So the whole um, state control, state framed system will sound very strange. And um, um, if I don't know if Sylvia or John want to add anything on this point, that we will have other questions. I think John, you you want to. Well, just just one thing, just to be clear that this is a product of the change made during the Craxi uh, government in the early 1980s. And so it was an attempt at trying to move beyond the old uh, concordat between the Catholic Church and the Italian state, which had been in place since 1929, which privileged the Catholic Church uh, financially. So, I mean, the Catholic Church has been receiving quite a lot of contributions from the Italian state uh, over the years. And the idea of this was to try and uh, level the playing field, so to speak, you know, was to make it then possible for these recognized uh, religions, as Maria Chiara points out, uh, who signed up with the state to get to get their share, so to speak, you know, and and they also introduced this kind of hour in schools at the same time, so that not all the kids went off to the local uh, parish, but uh, the non-Catholic kids could have their own uh, hour. This didn't always work very well. When you know, um, I speak from experience um, when my kids were in school. And, in Florence, and um, uh, I mean, there weren't enough of them to go off to a Presbyterian, uh, so they did art or something like that, you know, rather than going off with the priest to the to the local church. But the idea, these things were designed in the early 1980s to get away from the kind of very much the the shadow of the Catholic Church over the Italian state, and I and I think that's worth really worth emphasizing. Thank you, thank you, John. Um, I think that um, our colleague from MOU Florence, Christina Bellini, uh, is should be able to pose her question herself. Christina, can you can you yeah. hear me? Hi. Thank you. And I, buonasera. Just, it was just a, a brief, buonasera. Buonasera. It was just a, a brief um, um, question about um, mosque construction in historical centers uh, like Florence, for example, where. Um, there's been a, a, a 10 year long debate about the mosque construction and um, also uh, kind of on the um, type of design of the mosque that had to in some way mimic um, Florentine architecture, Renaissance architecture, um, and able to fit, you know, in, in, in order to fit into the to the center of Florence and um, a very long debate and still no mosque. So I was just wondering what um, the panelists thought about this. Again, Maria Chiara, Silvio, or John, any remarks on this? Yeah, I start. I break the eyes because it's a quick question, but a huge, not answer, but a huge issue. Because uh, there are different le level, I think, uh, concerning the, the debate around uh, the proposal uh, and the construction of a uh, mosque, in particular in the center of the city. And I think that it, there is uh, one uh, first question, what is a mosque in Italy? I mean, which kind, which type of mosque is uh, considered uh, to be realized? Because it's uh, the case of uh, transforming, converting, uh, uh, changing a building, changing the facade of the building or just the interior of the building uh, or build a, a, a new uh, a new building ex novo in order to have a new space. The second uh, level is about a top down or bottom up uh, approach to this uh, possibility. I mean, uh, are people, are Muslim people uh, in search for, they need, really need, uh, a mosque in the center of the city or it's most uh, a 
symbolical or a political uh, sign in order to say, okay, there is a, a new religion, a religion other than Catholic, uh, which is not only uh, in the outskirts, in the peripheral uh, um, area of one city, but in the center. And then I, I think that uh, there is a uh, anthropological level, and I mean, uh, people will use the mosque or it will be just a, a symbol, just a representation, just a signpost. Because if we think uh, uh, of the Grande Moschea di Roma, which is not in the center, but it's in a very rich uh, area, there is still a debate uh, on uh, about the use and the uh, access uh, every day, every week to this mosque. So I think uh, uh, it's a a very clever and a very important uh, question that opens to different uh, kind of uh, answers and I have not the time to develop them but I think that uh, uh, considering to involve also citizens uh, but also political institution cultural institution not in order to find a solution but in order to uh, not to be superficial and not to oversimplify the possibility of answer with a yes it's uh, okay it's fine no, we are against uh, the construction. I think that uh, posing the question in yes or no, it's a completely wrong and uh, dichotomy approach that I, that, I, that I don't like. So sorry for not the answer, but for open harder question, but I think that it's, uh, it's the path. Um, I think uh, Stefano, Stefano Albertini, would you like to... Um, join our discussion and pose uh, a question live? I think so. Perfect, I see, I see, I, we see you. Hey, come yes, very quickly, first of all, thank you so much to all the panelists for a brilliant conversation that really opened up our minds to read the urban space in a different way. Uh, according to these categories. I, I can't wait to go, go back to Rome, for example, and explore these different venues. I'm, I'm much more familiar with Florence uh, because that's where NYU has its uh, Italian uh, site and that's where I go. And that too is, is an example of how these uh, minority uh, religions a uh, little by little try to have a presence, a physical presence in the city. One question that I have for the panelists is that I noticed that you didn't mention the synagogues. And uh, there are some of the synagogues, of course, that represent a huge impact on the urban space of the cities, namely Florence and Rome, that are built, by the way, in the similar style, that they can look like mosques, <laughs> talking about mosques. Uh, and they were built deliberately, for example, the synagogue in Florence, as you know, uh, as far as possible from where the ghetto was. The unification of Italy in Florence uh, implied the destruction of the ghetto, and when the Jewish community had to decide where to build the, uh, the synagogue, uh, they didn't want to be anywhere close to that place that was only a place of sorrow and very, very sad memories. So uh, the, the idea of being far from those memories prevailed on, on, on the historical continuity that they could have claimed. So the question is, what, is there a specific reason why, why you decided not to talk about the synagogues in this conversation? And that's the question. And the other one is, is just a, sim a simple um, historical note to the eight by thousand, lotto per mille. Uh, of course, as uh, when one of our colleagues was saying, that's part of the uh, Concordat revision of it in 1984 with Craxi. But it, actually it is a sort of a, a, the evolution of the prebenda of the uh, Convenzione Finanziaria of 1929, uh, that would su really surprise even more our American friends, according to that one, as a form of reparation, because that was the idea, as a form of reparation for the properties that the new Italian state stole from the church in the process of unification. And we're talking about hundreds of thousands of acres of, of land, real estate, and, and many other uh, forms of wealth as a form of reparation for that, this state would not return those things, but would provide a, a stipend for bishops and priests according to certain parameters that were established. So until 1984, Italian bishops and priests received a stipend from the state, from the Italian state. So that's you know, even more surprising. With 1984, that stopped. 
but the financial issue remains in the India is now, how are we going to transform that reparation that was in the form of providing salaries to priests and bishops in a different form? And the idea was the, the otto per mille. The positive evolution of that uh, awkward form of uh, collaboration between, between church and state is that the otto per mille became available also to other confessions that uh, stipulate in tese with the Italian state. So the origin is the reparation for the, um, for the real estate that was um, taken from the church. But with 1984, it, it was extended. And it somehow, I believe, from, the, from an, a political point of view, in the intentions of the legislator, it recognizes the social value of these churches, of these different churches, the fact that they uh, play a role in the, in the growth and in keeping communities united and provide a variety of different services. And then we have to say that the way in which the churches spend these money, it's, it's a completely different story. And the Catholic church uses it again, pr provide salaries, but also to restore buildings and to the upkeep of the church. For example, the Waldensians have made a, ve a very radical choice of um, using this fund only for uh, charitable works and social work. Uh, so it's very clear and they publish all the, all, the, all the budgets and how they spend things. So every confession has a different way of approaching it and of using this considerable uh, amount of money that comes from, from, from the state. And we have to repeat from the free choice of citizens that can put a little check mark next to the church of their choice or to the state. And if they don't uh, check any of the boxes, I believe it's uh, redivided whatever is left over according to the percentage of the ones who chose. Is that correct? Is that still? I, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Yes. Just a, it, it was a little yeah. historical uh, note to, to where ah. that comes from. Yeah, good. And if I can add one second, uh, it was also the, the possibility of receiving the auto per mille. It was also an uh, impact factor in uh, and a booster factor of uh, the agreements because all the agreements uh, uh, were uh, signed after this uh, revision of the concordat. So maybe I was thinking if this economic uh, aspect uh, have uh, uh, played some role in uh, in the stipulation of uh, the, the agreement. So I, I think that is a, a very important factor. And even today, it's not under attack, but uh, sometimes under uh, uh, debate and very interesting also to study how different churches make different uh, choices about the use and the collecting, but also the reusing and the distribution of, uh, of this money. So uh, many social, cultural, uh, uh, project are financed today by different Otto per mille. And about synagogue, I must say that for sure, uh, I, I just mentioned that uh, Jews and Valdensians were the, the first one to receive uh, the civil and the religious uh, and that was a uh, hit. I can add uh, to Florence and Rome during synagogue uh, because it was uh, built uh, immediately after uh, uh, the Statuto Albertino and uh, as uh, someone know, uh, the Mole Antonelliana, the symbol of the city was supposed to be the synagogue but this is another history for many reasons it became the uh, current synagogue which is uh, completely Muslim because it's oriental style and all my students think that it's a, a mosque and not a synagogue so the, the history is the same but the reason for which um, I was I kept the silence uh, uh, about synagogue is because uh, I was uh, focused on uh, the Christian uh, the first Christian non-Catholic and for sure it will be the second step of the next uh, our next uh, appointment if you will invite me again I will have a ready a ready uh, speech about the first synagogue and in uh, Turin and in Rome comparing uh, also the architecture and the process of uh, discussion now it's not a joke but I think that uh, step mm -hmm. by step in 15 minutes uh, I prefer to concentrate on uh, a Catholic and Christian uh, panel and then I will move, but I just started my and, research on uh, Singapore. Yes, and I think that also consider yourself invited, Massimo, put together something for next semester. No, and I think the question that Cristina Bellini asked is fundamental and should be included in the second stage because sure. it seems almost like Muslims have the status of the least favorite religious minority in Italy being under scrutiny 
uh, and under special surveillance for all the reasons we know, and especially because of the racist propaganda of some political parties, especially the Northern League, or the League as they're called now, they're no longer Northern. Um, so it's the, 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 the things that happen in the North, and I'm from there, so I know that area very well, so where leaders of the League would bring pigs to urinate on sites that have been identified as possible sites of construction for the mosque, uh, brings the, 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 the um, religious intolerance uh, in Italy to, to brand new levels in the contemporary times, of course, we're not talking about the Middle Ages. So I think we should, we should consider that. And it, the interesting thing, if we want to build on paradoxes, is that the, the, the synagogues built after the unification of Italy looking like mosques, and the mosques that are not built in any form because obviously uh, of the political ostracism of some of the of the of the political forces present in Italy today. That's that's uh, uh, that's going to make for an interesting conversation because it's, it's not going to it's not going to be only about architecture. And Christina rightly mentioned the debate about what style should the mosque have. Who are we to tell them what style they should build their mosque in? I mean, it's like for the Jews, it was a very deliberate choice. It was the co Jewish communities that opted for the sort of uh, stile moresco. No? It was ah, something that was the same. Yeah, yeah. Differentiate them from uh, churches. Of course, the nightmare was that are we going to build a synagogue that is going to look like a basilica? No, we're going to make something completely different. What is the model that we can look yeah. at? And it was the mosque. I mean, let alone that then they put organs inside the mosque, the synagogues, that is sort of unheard of and not against all rules. But um, yes, we, we should have another uh, puntata of, of Yeah, the, of yeah because uh, yeah, not for re-answering to Christina, but uh, the problem is also a confusion, uh, continuous confusion between uh, formal, informal, and legally legal. And so it's not true that uh, if mosques, uh, for example, are uh, non-formal, unformal, and invisible, they are illegal. But in media and in political communication, and Silvia knows this debate very well, better than me, um, very often uh, the informality is uh, exchanged with or called illegality and so they are they become a victim of uh, a social stigma very very dangerous yeah and we have to remember for our uh, american friends who are not aware of it that there is a very large beautiful luxurious mosque in rome just in outside of the city so uh, that was financed by a variety of different actors. We're not going to get into that now, but it is a, one of the most beautiful mosques in the world from what I hear. And uh, so, but in that case, for example, the price to pay for that kind of presence and for that kind of uh, grandiosity was to be outside of the center of the city, obviously. And so, Stephanie, but you're referring for the next episode, then I'm going to shut up. And in mentioning the mosque of Rome, you're referring to the one in uh, Parioli, Corso Francia. Am I correct? Uh, the I Grande Moschea, the Grande Moschea di Roma. Yeah. Uh, is that it's one? In, uh, yeah, it's not in the center, but it's in uh, Parioli. It's, it's in Parioli, the most yeah, so exclusive yeah. residential neighborhood of Rome. But uh, 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 Stefano, uh, I, I, so again, Maria Chiara has um, uh, again. So the, the the issue of the the of including uh, Jewish communities in this in this ar argumentation and this examination is open. I would say. Uh, the, the uh, much of the religious diversity that we experience and we see today in Italy comes from immigration, uh, which which is Silvia has also somehow highlighted. And so, of course, uh, in in studying today, uh, Italy uh, has not experienced in the last fifty years the religious immigration of other denomination and confessions like Orthodox, Muslims, and Sikh. Six. And so I would say it is it, Jewish parents should definitely be considered and included, but probably on a political and even uh, scientific level, the most pressing issues come from um, outside the Christian communities, come from other denominations, other groups like, again, Sikhs, Muslims, um, and other even uh, Asian communities. Silvia, the, uh, we are we are approaching the end of our discussion. Silvia, do you want to add something, or am I? Is that is that true or not? 
Mm, no, 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 because I don't have to add anything to what uh, Maria Chiara said because uh, uh, we work uh, together and uh, I agree with uh, Maria Chiara, okay. obviously. Okay. I will share uh, ideas by the uh, um, If, 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 again, if um, none of our panelists uh, would like to add anything, and I see that this point or our the public's questions have been answered. Um, I think, as we were been saying in the last part of our discussion, this is, of course, cannot be an exhaustive uh, final say and 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 answer on the issue we have raised for so, for so many reasons. The uh, necessary selection of some confessions and denomination over others, uh, with that being, of course, uh, the Jewish community. Uh, in this case, as Stefano was uh, was saying, uh, and the fact that the 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 whole question relates to many different levels. So there is a legal framework, and there is the history of how Italian legislation has changed over time. Uh, there is a work that has to be done on the field, a work on uh, trying to understand how perhaps, for instance, that le same legal framework impacts communities today. And this is not a theoretical work. You, we have to see how religious diversity is practiced, can find room in Italian cities today, while some confession meet in garage, meet in anonymous invisible spaces, and some instead um, have recognized fine this space. It's not just about, as we were saying at the end, about legal recognition. There is, there is some, there is a present that theoretically can be recognized that is legitimate, but does not find a place because there is not a political and cultural environment that accept that present. And so we should not, for, for instance, assume that confessions that could illegally operate, legally practice, they will necessarily be visible and in do and indeed have their own spaces. So, but I would, again, these are just some of the topics that will remain open. Uh, I would like to thank both um, uh, Jogna Agnu, Maria Chiara Jordan, and Silvio Veneto for sharing their lat latest research, as especially in the case of Silvia and Maria Chiara, and but also for John for um, uh, updating for sharing with us um, a decades long uh, research that he has pursued, uh, produced over time. And so to bring the, uh, together the uh, scholars from different uh, uh, academic communities, from different generations over the topic, I think made the content of the discussion hopefully even more valuable. And so thank, thanks to Maria Kito Agnew, Maria Chiara Giorda, Silvia Menetto, Thanks to those of you who has who have posed questions and participated in the discussion. Uh, I saw that there has been a very very large participation of uh, of many people in the uh, from the public. And so my last thank go to all of you who have decided to uh, participate to join us today, either in an early morning from LA, as it was John's case, even in a lunchtime here in New York or in a late evening from any of uh, our Italian cities. For all of you, thank you so much. Uh, please keep uh, as uh, keep involved and keep um, looking at Casa Italianas and NYU's email for any uh, for our following events. And, and so thank you again. Buonasera a tutti and see you next time.